blessing and a wonderful privilege to be so uncaught up with the things of the world that we have time for God. He always has time for us. He's always there ready and waiting and looking forward to those times of fellowship when we join together with him in prayer, in study of his word, in memorizing his word, in meditating upon his word. And what a joy it brings to us when we actually take time to do that. I hope that you spend time with the Lord on a very regular basis every day, whether morning or evening or perhaps at your lunch hour. Take time to be holy, to be set apart, to be separate, as our Lord has commanded us to do. Our text this morning, as we have read a few moments ago, reminds us of what God did in the life of Moses and what God also does in the life of every believer. When he calls us to salvation, and he indeed gives an effectual call to salvation for those who are his elect, when he calls us to salvation, it is not merely so that we have a free ticket to heaven. His call is designed to bring us into service and to bring us into spiritual warfare. He gifts and enables all those whom he calls to serve him. Even as he did with Moses, he made sure that Moses understood that God would be with him, but that he had a specific job for Moses to do, and he would gift him for the fulfillment of that job. We've seen in the last three weeks how that God has also gifted us with spiritual gifts, we looked at the seven charismatic gifts. They are no longer being given today. But there are still the 15 remaining gifts for service. And we've gone through a little bit of that as we've looked at the gift of evangelist to help us get our bearings as to where this is all going. But we also looked last week at the basic principles for the exercise of every one of the spiritual gifts. We notice that every Christian has at least one supernaturally given spiritual gift, which is given to you at the moment of salvation by the Holy Spirit, and is designed for the benefit of the entire church, not merely for your own personal benefit. We saw principle number two, that some permanent service gifts are what we would call every believer gifts. That is, every believer has been given those particular gifts. And so, if you are a Christian, you have those gifts. And we gave you a couple of examples. For example, the gift of faith. That is clearly a gift. You did not work up faith inside yourselves. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, make it very clear to us 
that faith is the gift of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith is an every believer gift. The gift of giving is an every believer gift also. And it's important for us to be exercising those gifts. But that enabled us to see point number three, which was sometimes we fail to exercise our gifts. That is, we may refuse to walk by faith. Or we may refuse to give for some carnal reason, but that does not mean that the gift does not exist. The fourth principle that we learned was other permanent service gifts are what we would call restricted gifts. Those gifts are restricted to only a few people. In some cases, they are gifts that are restricted to men only. And we gave the example of the gift of pastor-teacher. It's a combination gift, as we see in Ephesians chapter 4, of both pastoring and also teaching. A man who would be a pastor must also be a teacher. Though a teacher may not necessarily be a pastor, but one who would be a pastor must be a pastor teacher. And we talked about that at some length last week. We saw that that was one of the four leadership speaking gifts listed in Ephesians chapter 4. What that means is that that gift is never given to women. And Paul, we saw, gave four specific, unchanging divine mandates as to why women are never given that particular gift. Number one, the divinely established order of authority. And we looked at the verses concerning that. Number two, the divinely established order of creation, man being made before woman and woman being made for man. Third, the divinely established order of purpose. And so we came to the conclusion that women are never given any of the leadership gifts in the church because God never violates the principles that he has laid down in his word for the operation of the gifts. Fifth principle that we learned was even during the apostolic times, many of the gifts were restricted to only a few individuals, even among the so-called charismatic gifts which goes right in the face of the modern charismatic movement, which claims that, for example, the way that you prove that you have the Holy Spirit is by speaking in tongues. And that is contrary to scripture because tongues is specifically said as a gift that was not given to everyone. It's listed in that list of gifts that were not given to everyone. And we talked about the way you can answer questions in Greek either with a yes answer, a no answer, or a, an unknown answer. And how Paul phrases the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 29 and 30, expecting no answers on every case when he says, are all apostles? Answer, no. Are all prophets? Answer, no. Are all teachers? Answer, no. And so on, down to the last gift. Do all speak in tongues? No. <clears throat> Do all interpret? No. So even in the early church, that was not a gift that was given to everyone. Not only the sign gifts were limited to a few, even there at Corinth, but also some of the permanent service gifts, like the gift of teacher, is placed in that list as well, and that is limited to a few as well. We saw principle number six, that all spiritual gifts are supernatural and not merely natural. They are all called supernatural gifts by the Greek text. And the supernatural gifts are not identical with natural abilities. Principle number seven, the spiritual gifts are all essential, but God prioritizes the gifts. So their value compared one to another may rank higher or lower in terms of their value for the body of Christ in the church. Principle number eight, which is where we closed last week, the spiritual gifts are compared to members of a single body. They don't work for themselves, they work for the good of the entire body. And we read two extended passages which deal with that very principle, hammering it home. Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So today, we're looking at principle number nine as we continue our study of the gifts and we want to get into the specific gifts so that you will be able to see what is it that God has given you so that you can function here at Bible Presbyterian Church in a way that pleases Christ and fulfills the responsibility. Gifts are not merely gifts for fun. When we think about receiving gifts, we perhaps think about what we get at Christmas time and uh, we think of, oh, all the fun things that we can do with that. But the gifts that God gave you are so that you could serve other members of the body of Christ. Do you know what your gift is? Your gifts, plural. You have more than one. Do you know what they are so that you can serve others here in this church? Well, principle number nine, where we start today, some but not all of the gifts have qualifiers 
or modifiers stating how they must be exercised. Let me give you just three verses out of Romans chapter 12, verses 6, 7, and 8. Paul is talking about having gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. And then down in verse 7, he talks about some gifts and he just tells you to do it. But then we move to verse 8 and he tells you certain gifts, how to do it. Verse 7, ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. In other words, if you've got ministry, minister. If you have the gift of teaching, teach. But then he moves into verse 8, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Very interesting word for simplicity, duplotes, that is used there. We'll talk about that when we get to the gift of giving. There is a very special way in which we must give. You'll have to wait for that, though. We'll get there in a minute. But he tells you when you give, it has to be done in that way. He that ruleth with diligence. If you have the gift of ruling, then you have an obligation as to how it's supposed to be done. It has to be done with diligence. You can't be slothful in this. You can't be haphazard in this. You can't be lackadaisical in this. If you have that gift, and if you are in a position whereby you are exercising the gift of ruling, you can't be slothful in it. Oh, how much the scripture says about sloth versus diligence. And what happens to the man who is slothful versus what happens to the man who is diligent? He that ruleth with diligence he that showeth mercy. Very interesting. With cheerfulness. You know, there's a temptation when showing mercy not to be cheerful about it. Well, when we get to the gift of mercy, we'll talk about what it means to show mercy with cheerfulness. There are modifiers for certain ones of the gifts that tell us how we're supposed to do them. Other ones, you simply do it. You got the gift of teaching, you teach. You got the gift of ministration, you minister. But if you've got the gift of mercy, you do it with cheerfulness. With giving, you do it with simplicity. With ruling, you do it with diligence. Now, the remaining 35 gifts, that, or excuse me, the remaining 15 gifts that we have today are the evangelist, the pastor, teacher, the teacher, governments, ruling, helps, faith, wisdom, self-control, discerning of spirits, giving, ministration, exhortation, mercy, and hospitality. Now, we've already discussed the gift of evangelists quite extensively, but let me just give you the definition again so you're reminded of it. We won't talk about it, just the definition. The gift of evangelists enables certain men, not women, to proclaim the gospel and to establish, train, and oversee new local churches, what we call church planting missionaries. The gift of pastor teacher, we've also seen quite a bit about that, but I want to cover a little more today that we have not yet covered. The gift of pastor teacher enables men with the gift of teacher or the gift of evangelist to shepherd a local assembly of believers. We see it stated as a spiritual gift in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And as we pointed out, he uses the word some in front of all of that. Not everybody has any of those gifts. We've seen some of those limitations. The word pastor means shepherd. That's the word for a shepherd. So what must a shepherd do? Well, the Apostle Paul explains it in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, where he's talking to the Ephesian elders. And he reminds them that they have a pastoral role. Elders have a pastoral role. Now, if you were with us on Sunday evening some months ago, we talked about the spiritual offices. The office of deacon, the office of a bishop or an elder. And we saw that bishops and elders refer to the same individuals, but different aspects of their responsibilities. Now, Paul is giving a farewell address to the elders at the church of Ephesus. He's on his way to Rome. Uh, he knows that he'll never see them again. And so he calls them out and he gives them this very brief little message. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, unto all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Rather interesting as you look at even that one verse there, how many incredible doctrines are in it. We see that the church is referred to as the flock, but we find it is the Holy Ghost who has made them overseers, and that's the word for bishops. He's speaking to the elders. It tells us in the preceding verses that he's called for the elders of the church at Ephesus, and now he speaks of them as the bishops, the overseers. Their responsibility is to feed the church of God. Now, that's a very important word for feed. We're going to see it a little bit later. There are two different words used for feeding in the New Testament that relate to different things. And I'll tell you about that one when we get to it. But that's the word poimino. It means to 
to tend sheep as a shepherd, not merely to put food in their mouths. It means to protect them. It means to heal up their wounds. It means to keep them from straying. It means to make sure that they are taken care of in a shelter, take them to water, lead them, and guide them. It's a word that covers every aspect of shepherding. Shepherd the flock of the church of God which he, and interesting, your antecedent is God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Jesus Christ is God. The emphasis here we see is on the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ in that verse. Why do you have to take care of the flock, not merely put food in their mouths? Because he tells you in verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. That is an external attack by apostates. There are going to be those who come in who pretend to function as elders of a flock but who are actually there as wolves to eat the sheep. It's an external attack, not sparing the flock. But there's not only the external attack with the grievous wolves who come in from the outside. He says, but also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. Perverse things are stubborn things, rebellious things, you know, resistant things. Not wanting to follow leadership, but wanting to become leaders. We'll see that's a characteristic of apostates in a moment. Speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. There are people who come in and split the church. There are people who come in and pull people after them. That's an internal attack by, attack by self-willed and proud men who try to usurp leadership to control and divide. And so he goes on to verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. This was so important that the Apostle Paul preached it for three years at Ephesus. He preached it night and day. This was one of his constant themes. And he's bringing them back to it because he knew what would happen at Ephesus. Ephesus was a sound Bible-believing church. We see that from the epistle to the Ephesians. But it was a church that didn't heed the warning. And the warning that is given to it in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches, it is a church that is gone today. Serious warnings to God's people here. Serious warnings to those who are in positions of authority, how they must protect the flock and watch over it. Peter also speaks of these same things in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, where he's talking about the responsibility of those who are elders and the responsibility of those who shepherd and pastor a flock. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. Now Peter had the gift of apostle, but he had the office of elder. We need to keep the spiritual gifts distinct from the spiritual offices. The spiritual offices will be men who have certain gifts, but you can be disqualified from an office, whereas you will never lose a gift. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So Peter is here addressing church leadership and pointing out that he is also an elder. He is on an equal level with them when it comes to church office. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now here he says the same thing that Paul said to the Ephesian elders. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight, there's the word for bishop, thereof not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. You don't go into the ministry for money. There are many apostates in apostate denominations who are in it for the money, and they get big salaries, many of them. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. It's not so that you can be power hungry and control people. You go so that you can be an example to the flock of what it means to walk by faith, what it means to walk in the spirit, what it means to walk a Christ-like life so that others will have a physical example to follow. Being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, that's the chief pastor, when the chief shepherd shall appear, 
ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You see, there are a lot of us who are under shepherds. We're little peep squeak shepherds down here taking care of a tiny little group of people. But the flock of our Lord Jesus Christ extends around the world and extends all the way from the day of Pentecost until now. And there is one who is the chief shepherd to whom all the under shepherds must give an account. And if they are faithful under shepherds, the chief shepherd will give them a crown of glory that never fades away. I'm drawn up short every day with that as I make decisions, as I choose what to do. I can't do some things that perhaps my flesh would like to do because I'm an example for this flock. And someday I will have to give an account to the chief shepherd. And so will every one of your elders. Pray for them. Pray for me. We have responsibilities beyond that which you can imagine. Where did Peter get that idea of a pastor or an elder's responsibility? Did you know that Jesus gave it to him specifically after the resurrection? John chapter 21, beginning in verse 14. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me at all? <laughs> Do you love me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Peter had had three denials. Christ asked Peter three questions. Christ recommissions Peter three times when Peter admits his own inadequacy. Oh, I wish we had time to talk about it. Two different words for love that are used here in this passage, agape and the verbal form agapao, and phileo, and two different forms of feeding. We have feed my lambs is bosco. That's merely to pasture, to fodder, or to graze in that first verse. But then we move back to poimino, the one that I told you about a moment ago, which covers every aspect of shepherding. Feed my sheep, poimino, my sheep. And then, finally, he goes back to Bosco. Feed my sheep in the last verse. Give them food. I've counted thy word more than my necessary food, says the scripture. My job is to feed you, not to tickle your ears. My job is to give you food that is good for you, whether you like it or not. My job is also to tend you and take care of you and to try to hedge you aside from the wolves that are certainly out there and ready to gobble you up. Jesus gave those responsibilities to Peter. That first, you love me more than these, is comparative. It's sort of a, um, a play on words there because they had just brought in the fish. And Peter, had, before this, had just declared, well, I'm going to go fishing. So Jesus is asking him a comparative on the first level. Do you love me more than these? What do you love more, Peter, the things of the world or me? Same question he asks you. Do you love me more than these, these things? But there's also a deeper play on the word there, too, because you recall that Peter at the Lord's table, the Last Supper, had said, even if all the rest of these forsake thee, I'll never forsake you. And Jesus is prodding him, Peter, do you really love me more than these? You boasted about it. And Peter responds, well, Lord, I'm very fond of you. He uses a different word for love. 
you know, I really, really, really like you. I'm really fond of you. But he doesn't use the word that Jesus used. Jesus uses that word agape twice. But even in the last question, he says, well, Peter, do you, are you really even fond of me? He uses phileo. Peter responds all three times with phileo. Peter knows how weak he is. Peter knows that he doesn't have the kind of love that Christ is calling him to have. Peter doesn't yet have it, but he will in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. How much we learn of a pastor's responsibility, that's contrasted for us with false pastors and false teachers in the book of Jude and 1 Peter. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The minute we stop contending for the faith, we fall prey to what Jude is about to describe. We can't just sort of believe it, sort of have it on the shelf. We've got our Bible dictionary up there and we can dust it off and look something up when we need to. We are to contend for the faith. That is that body of truth that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Earnestly contend for the faith. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Folks, that's double predestination, even though some folks don't like that. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what they're going to attack is the person and work of Christ. Likewise, it tells you what they're going to be like in their moral character. Also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, that is, they act like animals, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They ran greedily after the arrow of Balaam for reward. They perished in the gainsay of Cori. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves. Rather interesting, the word feeding there is poimino shepherding themselves, tending to themselves. All the things that a shepherd is supposed to do for his flock, it's what they do for themselves. They don't do it for the flock. Feeding themselves. Shepherding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth. You know, eating withered fruit is not very pleasant. Now, I don't like to throw away anything, so... <laughs> Every now and then I'll buy a bag of apples that doesn't quite get eaten up by the family. I buy lots of fresh fruit. I put it out so that as the kids walk by, they'll take fruit instead of candy bars. So we have bananas and apples and oranges and different kinds of apples. And some apples are more favorite than other kinds of apples because I've bought many different kinds. And so some of those tend to sit there for a while. And they get witheder and witheder and witheder. And finally when they get to a certain point, and I know they're going to start to rot after that, I go ahead and eat them you know, because nobody else ate them. And then I put out fresh ones. Um, if we're eating, eating withered fruit that's really withered, really, really dried up, that's what these people are like, whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. You go up to a tree that's totally dead, in fact, it's ripped out of the ground. That's what they're like. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, in those verses, Jude has just given us 18 ways to identify false pastors and false teachers. Number one, they deny the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. That's the gospel, that body of definitive truth as to who Jesus is and what he did. Two, they pretend to be fellow Christians. They're infiltrators. They creep in unawares. They're not external enemies because they become assimilated inside the body. They turn grace into freedom to commit immorality. That's what that word lascivious means, lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is total, utter shamelessness about things that are immoral. They deny some person, some aspect of the person or work of Christ. They claim visions and dreams. They're filthy dreamers. They see things in a dream or a vision that's designed to tempt you into things that are evil. They morally defile their own bodies. They despise dominion. The word despise there is... Atheteo, to set aside, to neutralize, or to violate. 
they neutralize and violate dominion. That's kuriotes. That's lordship, government, rulers, lords, masters, from the word kratos, which is the word used to describe the dominion of Christ. In 1 Peter 4.11, Jude 25, and Revelation 1.6. They speak evil of dignities. We'll talk about that in a moment. It's the same phrase used by Peter in 2 Peter 2. They mock and they criticize holy things. They negate anything that cannot be known by natural methods. You know, it's, uh, it, it talks about them as being what they know naturally. They scorn anything that can't be tested or what we would say testable by science. You know, people who are like that, they are naturalists. They have the morals of animals, like brute beasts, it says. They are motivated by covetousness and greed. That is, they're selfish and they're self-centered. What's in it for them? They are rebellious. They try to shove their ways into positions of authority. That's why he gives the illustration of Korah. You remember Korah who rebelled against Moses with Dathan and Abiram. And God certainly put short end to their lives. They don't pastor and feed others, they feed themselves. They take advantage of the believers at the agape feast, the church fellowship dinners. They abuse fellowship. They're like rotten spots in the food, it says. Spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you. They promise you spiritual refreshment, but they are without water. They promise you spiritual food, but they are, their fruit withereth. They're without fruit. They're twice dead. They're plucked up by the roots. They never deliver on their promise. They're destructive. They're like raging waves of the sea. They are like the filthy foam exposing their own shame dredged up from the sea bottom. Raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. They have no discernible purpose or direction toward holy living. He calls them wandering stars. That's a weird light that leads you into darkness and onto the rocks. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Quite a distinction between the man who is a true pastor teacher with the gift of pastor teacher, exercising the gift of pastor teacher as he's supposed to, and the apostates who come in, and you can tell who they are by what they teach and by what they do. And yet, there are thousands of people in the United States following men like that who stand up and do nothing but give them bland drivel every Sunday. We have more warnings against false pastors and teachers in 2 Peter chapter 2. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, and despise government. Presumptuous they are, self-willed, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignities, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart have they exercised with covetous practices, cursed children." which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Basor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are ignorantly willing of, willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth, standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. There are twenty ways that Peter gives us. Jude gives us eighteen. Peter gives us twenty, so that we can identify those who are false pastor teachers, those who are false teachers. Number one, they're compared to the false prophets of the Old Testament. And that would take me two or three weeks just to cover that one itself. Number two, they work in secret to undermine the congregation. They come in privily, it says. That is, privately, secretly. Number three, they teach damnable heresies. The word hieresis, the word translated heresy, means they teach divisive doctrine condemned by God. You know, Paul warned about that, the men who would rise up seeking to draw away people after themselves. The cult of following a man, 
who pulls you away from the body of Christ. There are many of those out there today. They deny the doctrine of Christ, some aspect of the gospel. And it's rather interesting. It tells us even denying the Lord that bought them. Christ paid for their sins too. These apostates that are being described here, denying the Lord that bought them. And he's going to contrast that with something in just a second as we get farther. They will usually get a large following of biblically illiterate people. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, it says. Their teaching will bring criticism and shame to Christ and to Christianity. By whom, it says, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. It's people like this that bring shame to the name of Christ by the watching world. They're motivated by covetousness and greed. That's in contrast to Christ who purchased us, they sell us. It says they make merchandise of you. Jesus bought us with his blood. They'll take you and sell you for whatever they can get out of you. They sell us. They make merchandise of us. They walk in the flesh. They don't walk in the spirit. They practice the lust of uncleanness. And we won't have time to get to that today, but Lord willing, next week. That's a very important word, that word for uncleanness. It is a word that deals with moral impurity. It covers things like self-gratification, pornography, and other even more vile and wicked sins than those. And it's used, by the way, multiple times in the New Testament. We're not guessing on what it means. It's very clearly described, uh, or used to describe things in the New Testament. But we'll wait for the time that we get there. They despise government. The word government here is priotes, rulers, those in authority, masters, and lords. It's not the same word that's used for the gift of governments, which we'll discuss, I hope, today. We still have 15 minutes. It's not the word for the gift of governments, uh, which is the word kubernesis. They're self-willed. They despise everyone in every divinely ordained sphere of authority, the state, the church, the home, and employment. They are very, very rebellious against all those in authority. To despise means to think against. It's an internal attitude of scorning all forms of authority. They're presumptuous. They presume to have authority, which they themselves do not have. In other words, they agitate for rebellion and discontent against anyone who is in authority other than themselves. It tells us that they're self-willed. That is, they're their own final authority. They refuse to submit to the will of God or God-ordained authority. You, you see how many words he's using to describe the rebellious spirit of these people. They speak brazenly, and they speak brazen evil against the dignities. That word translated dignities is the word doxa. We find that word in our word doxology. We sing the doxology every Sunday morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That comes, that doxology, it comes from doxa, which means the glories, the Shekinah glory. Those who are in authority, who are reflecting the authority of God, they speak evil. That is, they slander those who are in authority by divine appointment. They are filled with and motivated by sexual lust. Their eyes tell it all, what they look at, pornography. Their eyes are filled with adultery, verse 14. They're filled and motivated by greed. Did you notice how many times greed showed up in these two passages? How these people are only in it for what they can get out of it? How much money can they get? Oh, that'll tell you something right away. Somebody who won't come and serve the church because you don't offer enough money? Be very careful. The apostates are the ones who are motivated by money and they will get everything out of you that they possibly can. They know the truth, but they're willing to sell themselves to work evil against God's people. That's the reason that the illustration of Balaam is given, following the way of Balaam, the son of Basor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He was a man who spoke directly with God. You read about it in the book of Numbers. He was a man who could directly talk to God. He knew God. But he was so filled with the desire for money, he was willing to sell the people of God. 
to Balak. He couldn't beat Israel, but he told Balak how he could. Just send those Moabitish girls down to the camp of Israel and seduce them and God would judge them himself. And that's what happened. And Balaam got his reward. He got his money, the wages of unrighteousness. But the text specifically tells us that when the children of Israel came into the land, Balaam, the son of Basor, they slew with the sword. He made his few bucks. He got himself rich. And it lasted for two or three months until God used the children of Israel to kill him. Balaam is given here as the illustration of the apostates. They promise that immorality will bring freedom even while they themselves are chained up with immorality. Did you get that? It says, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same he is brought into bondage. They scoff and mock at the prophecies of Christ's return and judgment. But when you find people that are mocking at the return of Christ, they don't believe Jesus is ever going to come back. You know, you've got somebody who is a very dangerous person. That's what he warns you about here. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They're uniformitarian in their viewpoints. Gets us back to the creation evolution thing. Peter puts it in here as a sign of apostasy. And they also deny the doctrine not only of creation but of the worldwide flood of Noah. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. There's creation and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. There's creation. And verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. There's the flood of Noah. He's given you 20 different ways so that you can identify the ones who are false pastors and false teachers. Oh, they'll use different terminology. They'll come in and they'll talk about theistic evolution. They'll talk about how God used evolution to get things there. And that uh, really the earth is four and a half billion. Now I think they've gotten up to 14 and a half billion. When I was in college, they said it was four and a half billion years old. Uh, now they know that's way too short. So they've pushed it up to 14 and a half billion. Dear people, those are apostates. Right off the bat, you can reject anybody who claims to be a teacher of the Bible who denies fiat creationism in six literal days and anybody who denies a worldwide flood in the days of Noah, even if you don't see any of the rest of these things. You can test them on that basis alone. So those are two of the signs of the apostates who try to creep into the church and get hold of the mind of the congregation. We move on to the gift of teacher. I can't see very well, but I think it is 12.15, and so we'll pick up teacher, the Lord willing, next week. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. How we thank you that you have given clear statements concerning the spiritual gifts, especially the leadership gifts. Father, we thank you for the gift of evangelist. We thank you for the gift of pastor-teacher and the gift of teacher and all the other service gifts that you have ordained for believers in this age to minister one to another in the body of Christ. We thank you, Father, that you've not only stated for us positively what a pastor-teacher is supposed to be like, but you've also stated for us clearly what the false pastor-teachers and teachers are like, what their doctrine will be like, what their moral character will be like. You have warned us, and Paul warned the Ephesians night and day for three years about the wolves that would come in from the outside and about those proud men who would rise up from the inside and try to drag people after themselves and split churches. A good, solid Bible-preaching church. But a church that didn't heed the warning. A church that was doctrinally sound, but a church that had lost its first love and needed to repent. For our Lord warned that if it did not repent and get back to its first love of Christ, he would jerk its candle out of its place. And so he did. Father, we pray for our church here. A church that we love. People that we love. Each one of us loves others who are here in this assembly. Those to whom you have called us to minister one to another 
not merely this pastor. Father, we pray for your hedge of protection. We pray for your immense blessing. We pray, Father, that you will help us to obey and use in the power of the Spirit the gifts that you have given us, that we might build one another up as we look forward with eagerness and anticipation to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the chief shepherd, the one who loves and cares for this flock. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.